thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony Frischconnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony Frischconnect. All right, I'm here with Matt and Chris Gillard. Thanks for being on Plant Problems, guys. I appreciate it. I wanted to fill the folks in a little bit about what your guys' background is, what brings you into the cannabis industry, some stuff like that, if that's okay. Yeah, so as a kid, I was certainly you know, a supporter of cannabis, a user of cannabis. And into my early 20s, I began to get into the cultivation of it on kind of a home scale in closets and in smaller setups like that. And then in 2009, I had started a hydroponic store in Portland, Maine, one of Portland's first original hydro stores, a grow shop, really, kind of a center for the community, for the people, for providing products for people to grow. And at that same time, I became a registered caregiver for the state in 2009 after Maine had reamped its medical program that I believe originally started in 1993 or somewhere around there. So in 2009, I had started the grow store and was caregiving at the same time. From there, that just developed and I began to put kind of more focus into the growing than I did the retail of the store, but still use the store as kind of a platform for different connections into the industry at large, not only the hydroponic industry, but the growing community. And it kind of connected me to both of those. And at the same time, I was really interested in art and music and kind of fused all three of those things together in that part of Portland that was operating the store out of. In 2016, we did, Indoor Plant Kingdom did three of the Portland cannabis markets, which was kind of a community approach to allowing caregivers to highlight what they were doing at that time. It was a free event for patients to come and check out some of the local landscape that was going on in Portland at that time and products that were available, different flowers that were available. And then from there, I had transitioned to focusing mostly just with the plants and putting my focus almost exclusively on working with the plant, as that was my original love, so to say. That was my original passion was the plants versus kind of the retail aspect of the industry. And that's continued to this day. So at this point in Maine, we've kind of taken a cottage industry into what's becoming a more legitimate and recognize medical industry moving into the rec market or adult use market, which is coming for 2020. And when did you bring your brother on board? Matt has kind of always been support on the mechanical side of things. Yeah, so I'm Chris's older brother, Matt Gillard, by two years. We've always kind of been in cahoots together. I, in 2001, traveled out to Northern California, had a little spot up in Trinidad, spent a year up there, made friends with a lot of great people, and met a lot of great community members up there. Came back home after traveling for a couple of years, bought a house, had to buckle down and get a real job. So I started a Colonial Brickworks, a small brick masonry company that we specialized in restoring first period colonial chimneys. So old house chimneys from 1630 to 1750 is what we were went around fixing. Got a construction supervisor license. And meanwhile, my brother's calling me up and telling me to outfit his closet. So I built him a grow room in a closet. Then he's calling me up to outfit the basement. So I outfitted the basement. The next thing I know, we're outfitting the barn. The next thing I know, we're outfitting a, a factory building. We're looking at another factory building. And so I really developed a love for the plant in growing outside the whole time on a very small scale. And then building these amazing rooms for my brother to really experiment and develop his skill and his art form for it. Matt seems to have more of a mechanical mind. I'm more of a plant person. You yeah, know, I kind of always yeah. see my lens through this entire process for just my love of plants. So I'm a gardener. You know, I'm, a, I'm into the medicine of plants, not just cannabis, but other plants as well. So in 2016, Massachusetts and Maine both voted to go rec. Before that, Maine was very, very liberal with their medical industry and Massachusetts was very, very stringent with their industry and their medical industry. So I called up my little brother and said, Maine's going to be easy to get into. Let's jump into the rec market there. I'm leaving masonry. Let's go 90 miles per hour. Governor LePage in Maine vetoed the bill and they stalled it and put the brakes on it and Maine just slowed down and went nowhere. Meanwhile, Massachusetts started focusing on local communities, local farmers, and they put a couple of laws in that you had to get a host community agreement in order to get a state license. 
So I went to my local politicians, my mayor, and said, I'm operating in the town that I was born and raised in. I live in the house. I bought it off of my parents. I'd really like to operate on a local farm that's been existent for 200 plus years and start a cultivation thing there. Luckily enough, they believed in me in my uh, desire to call them three times a week for multiple weeks on end, and they gave me a host community agreement. So now we're in the current phase of going through the special permitting process. State licensing. State licensing we have submitted, and we're building a custom-built 22,000 square foot Nexus greenhouse on the property that we own now. And our approach has definitely always been a shoestring approach. So when I started into Plant Kingdom, it was with one pallet of growth out of a barn that I was renting at the time and doing my caregiving in as well. From there, I had sublet a space from a friend of mine who was doing screen printing in the Lower East Bay side of Portland, Maine, which has now become a real destination for breweries and for events and what have you in the community of Portland. It's the center of the art scene now. And then from the sublet space, I rented a full retail space in that same building where I ran my store. But again, it was always really shoestring. I didn't start it with any credit cards. I didn't start it with any loans. I had $5,000 in my pocket that I basically bought the equipment with and sub up the space and just bootstrapped it for years. And people didn't really come to me because I had the most inventory. They certainly didn't come to me because I had the best selection of products. I just mostly think my love and desire for the plant and for working with people as well. You know, I just had a super interest in it. And I was super interested in what was going around going on with everything else around the cannabis community. Again, the art and the music, kind of the culture of it was most fascinating to me. And we're still really in that stage too. We don't necessarily have a license granted from Massachusetts yet. We don't have a rec license granted in Maine yet. Uh, Those are just opening up the first of the year. So we're still very small scale. We're still bootstrapping it. We're doing it with our own capital. We're doing it with our own sweat equity. We're general contracting these projects ourselves. and. It's all very much a homegrown capital, and we don't have any big people sitting behind us. It's cool to see. I That's kind of my side where I come from, too, is the caregiver side. And so, you know, just to kind of expand on that a little, the transition for you, because, you know, I know there's a lot of black market growers that are either thinking about trying to move to the next stage, but you know how challenging that that can be. Just that switch over is not easy. You're dealing with a lot of tax issues, you're dealing with a lot of government officials. And I try to share, at least with the guys that I know, I try to share with them that it is possible that you can transition, but it is a stretch. I mean, it takes a lot. I mean, how much have you guys put out there really? You know, we've been fortunate to have a pretty solid team, even though it's small, but the, the law firm that we work with, the accountants that we work with, the business advisors that we have, the people like Damien that help make certain connections for us, have helped navigate us through that process. And we're dealing, working with all family members or or close family friends is everybody that's involved with this. That's typically how we've done it, yeah. It's kind of certainly a family-run approach, absolutely. That's good. Well, you know, I think that's another thing you pointed out, advisors. Yeah. You know, you want to find the good ones, right? But they also cost money. You have Mm -hmm. to invest into that. And I think that's hard for the new entrepreneur to understand sometimes because they're wondering how to stretch that dollar, right? If you're shoestringing it, do I spend 5,000 on this attorney or do I try to save the 5,000 and put it into the grow? I mean, these are things you guys have to work with. What what I've done on the immediate local level that didn't cost me anything and was the greatest value that I got was when we started writing the zoning in town, I went to all the zoning board meetings. I went to all the city council meetings. I made friends with all my counselors. And now when I walk through my local town, people recognize me on the government level, uh, which I never thought would be a thing. But uh, I really had the opportunity where this was a brand new industry in Massachusetts to write some of the regulations. And when they were talking about zoning and where should we zone this, oh my God, marijuana farm, I said, why don't we incorporate the farms in town? We have this area in town that has a bunch of farms. Let's put that and maybe this would incentivize our farmers. Knowing that I had a lease on one of those farms and I was trying to get that in my pocket. And that did take going on Wednesday night at seven o'clock, twice a month to the town hall to sit through some ridiculously boring meeting and shake hands and talk to people about cannabis that had no idea of what I've seen, where I've been. And they have their idea of cannabis is more of a a bag of oregano in a plastic bag that they they confiscated. 
Yeah, there's certainly a lot of challenges too with, I mean, I didn't fall in love with business. You know, I'm not really a business person per se. You know, I didn't fall in love with insurances or dealing with lawyers or paying accountants to look at my books. I mean, I'm in love with cannabis. You know, that's what the, I love most is the plant and what that, the, the joy that I can give to people when I produce something that I really love. I can share it with a loved one, a friend or family member or a patient and then see that excitement that they share. You know, that's what I love most, you know. And then again, some of the other aspects that surround it, I really enjoy. So it's been, it's certainly a challenge for me to just maintain that moving forward. But I think if I continue to have that conviction, that love for the plant and just doing what I really ultimately believe in, that's going to be successful for me. You know, it's not trying to create this McDonald's sort of brand or this recognizable brand that that's going to make me successful. You know, I, I feel that it's just my love and my drive that will do that ultimately. A word that's been thrown a lot around is sustainability. And the way we've practiced cannabis in the past 20 years has sustained us and sustained our lives. And we haven't hurt anybody or anything while doing it. So we're going to take that same model and keep trying to be more and more sustainable with our plant growth in our life and our culture. And that's not just with what we use, but the people that we employ, we're going to deliver our message to. Our customers, we're going to deliver our message to. And we're going to really hammer home the fact that quality above all is what we're looking for. Uh, we've yeah, been touring absolutely. a lot of the Denver dispensaries when we're out there. We just finally started touring the Massachusetts dispensaries. Massachusetts on Wikipedia three years ago was ranked number 47th in a cannabis cultivation. And they were, this was in 2016 when they went rec. And at the time, I believe they were the second or third largest rec market population. So we had a using population that was one or you know, two or three in the country. And we had a cultivation population that was ranked number 47. The people that have moved into our industry in Massachusetts now are the big business competitors that have none of the love that my brother has and none of the feel and the principles that they have. And it shows in their product. It shows in their staff. It shows in the layout of their facilities. And we walked into a facility yesterday and we were handed a menu that looked like a, my check would come from it at a restaurant. And they said, if you want to be expedited, check off what you want in the menu and go straight to the register. And we certainly quickly realized as well that there's a need for that. We recognize the fact that a lot of people are okay with that. You know, and this is a new system to them. So that's what they're going to know for a lot of people. But we also recognize the fact that there are a lot of people who have a deep love and, you know, that want more of that artisan sort of approach. And that's where we come from, like how we handle the herb, our intentions with working with the plant, how we process the plant is of the utmost importance. So you let know? me ask you, when he handed you that menu, were you a bit confused at the time? Like, did you, I mean, I know you're around cannabis a lot, but if you're the new user, how's the new user supposed to understand what they're getting into? Right. Exactly. And he said, if you want to speak to the bud tender, step over into this line and wait for the bud tender. And they only had one bud tender on staff at the time. So the three of us walked up and spoke to this one bud tender and he was able to handle us. But that was after waiting five or eight minutes for him to finish with the previous patient. Okay. Or previous customer, I should say, it was adult use. So obviously these guys have big dollars that they're coming in with, which you guys don't. So aside from customer service, which it sounds like you guys are going to try to provide the top possible, what sets you apart from these other guys that really where people will be like, oh. Some of the things that we hope that will stand us apart is education, is educating our customer of what we do differently and why we're different from the next guy and why our products we feel are created with more love and more passion and more drive and more conviction in, in our belief system. You know, we're going to try to just educate our customers with that. And we hope that they have the choice to make and they can choose one or the other. And we're happy with whatever they choose, but we're confident that we're going to make people will, will support our vision. And we're, we're going to make decisions too on, we plan on giving significant amount of money back to the communities. And we're going to really focus on where we put that money and tying our name with them and their name with us. So we're going to support other local organic businesses and really try to build a network and community around high quality, clean products. And certainly you may as well to just to add on that is that I've had the opportunity in the past 10 years to build that network. So there are certainly a, a, you know, a good portion of people in Maine who I have a lot of connections with that, that support me, that support what I do and that are behind kind of my vision and our vision. 
what ideas have you guys come up with to give back? It's a good point for people to understand that. If you wouldn't mind sharing some ideas that you guys are looking at doing, are you guys okay with that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the first things that I've done from day one with Indoor Plant Kingdom is with yards. I mean, that's one of my own personal loves is in supporting artists, so supporting local artists. So all of our designs really aren't done by digital designers, but they're more done, or graphic designers, what have you, but they're done by local artists. And throughout my entire process, we have dozens of commission pieces that I've reached out to local artists and say, hey, listen, can I hire you to help me with this? I mean, it's a small example, but that's one of the things that we want to continue to do, as well as putting money back into education, putting money back into schools. And, you know, we'll, we'll have some help with that. I mean, when we get there, we're going to have to certainly put some more yeah. thought into the ways in which we can give back. And, you know, one of the thoughts that we've had recently is allowing some of our vendors to sit down with our vendors to say, hey, look at, you know, what do you guys believe in? What do we believe in? What are some causes locally that we can give back a percentage of our sales to those, whether it's veterans or education? Jamaco down in Massachusetts has committed, is sitting next to us, Haverhill. They have a large homeless population. Their local homeless shelter is Emmaus Group. And they do a lot of good things for the community and they sponsor a bike ride. So we've been in talks with them with helping them sponsor that bike ride and working with them to see what their needs are on a small level where we're not advertising what we're doing necessarily, but helping them with the the actual mechanical aspects of it. Our older brother is a bicycle mechanic, so he's going to come down and help donate with that. Hiring local people is a real big cause for us. We want to put our money that we're spending back into the local community. So if you're from the town Amesbury that our business is located in, you're definitely going to get, I can't say preferential treatment, but we're going to look at you a little bit closer in getting a local person in and promote the local company. Those are all great things. I mean, obviously promoting your local economy, you guys are a small business. It's nice to help the small businesses around you, especially providing jobs for people. I think I look less statistically the cannabis market in Colorado, I believe it was at 5,000, I think it's 5,000 plus people are employed by the cannabis industry right now, which is pretty huge. And it goes down to choosing your growing methods. We're specking a hybrid greenhouse. It has a glass roof. It's great on a business thing. It's going to drop our cost production. It's great on a plant health thing, having the full spectrum sunlight to help grow our plants. It's pretty neat when it gets cloudy. We can turn our lights on a little bit and we're able to grow in a much wider soil medium in there. So on the farm that we're located, there's a cow herd and we're going to try to implement their byproducts, their manure. It's broken down after one or two years and using that for our soil to produce. So you brought up the uh, greenhouse that you guys are building. Were you able, talking about financing, were you guys able to get that finance through the greenhouse company or is that something you guys are paying for on your own? That's not something we're able to get through. They didn't finance us, no. Okay. And it's something that we've been able to, to scrape together with some family help, pull on some family loans and get it completed that way. They aren't cheap to start up, but it comes down to the general contracting. My other company, Colonial Brickworks, we're going to general contract it. The excavating work, the farmer also has a bunch of excavating equipment, so he's going to do all the dirt work excavating it. So we are looking at using friends and family in the contracting of it to really drop our price per square foot of construction. Those greenhouses do start to run at 250 a square foot. You get really nice $300 a square foot for brand new installation. If we can drop that down into the $175 range, it suddenly becomes affordable. It sounds like you're accessing whatever resources you can to make it possible. And really, that's what it takes. You know, and I think people on the outside get so overwhelmed by the actual upfront capital that they think it's going to cost. It seems to scare them away a lot of the time, at least from what I, people that I've talked with, right? It can be overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. We've been fortunate, too, that we have, Chris has a working model and reputation that family and friends will trust and rely on us because they've seen the consistent output of the high quality since it allowed. So Chris, you know, you've got a nice advantage because of course you get your materials at cost coming in, right? And then you're able to influx them into your other company. For people that aren't able to do that, would you have any ideas on, on how they could maximize their dollar when they go in to purchase from either a store like yours or a gardening center? 
Yeah, that's a tough question. That's a good question. I mean, my model has always been, you know, maximize what you already have. So instead of adding 10 extra lights to a system, make sure that the 10 lights that you started with, that you're really maximizing. And there's, there's a lot of ways that you can increase your efficiency without spending more money. So that's what I would always tell people, you know, if you're getting a pound to a pound and a half per light, where you should be getting two to three pounds per light, and then you want to add more lights, well, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's a simple way, but to say, hey, listen, let's just make sure that you're getting the most out of the equipment that you already use. So that's one of the easiest ways I would probably suggest start, to start Starting smaller and rather than starting bigger. Yeah, yeah, kind of walk before you can run sort of mentality. You it's know? interesting the two different markets. It, Massachusetts has a 100,000 square foot license market. And if you're going to build a 100,000 square foot grow, you're looking at 15, 20 million. Maine's largest license that they're going to offer is 20,000 square feet. They're really seeing a much smaller, much more niche market. So if we're outfitting a, a 5,000 square foot grow to get us into a, the craft cannabis market upfront cost, but we've even spoken with other grow stores and said, do you guys offer financing packages? If we need 100 lights from you, could you give them to us for 70,000 rather than 100,000? And, you know, Chris, you bring up a great point in maximizing the lights and the products you have. I mean, so many people, they're not maximizing their yields. And these are little tweaks and little things you can do around your room to make it better. But if you go in and never grow and you throw up 100 lights, and you get a half a pound per light, you really have no idea what you're doing and what you're doing. <laughs> it's true. Exactly. It's not working out. It looks like you got a lot of weed, but it, the so, math is So less there. is more. I mean, again, I've had the advantage for, for 10 years in the medical market to just learn how to grow and to understand that. And, and years before that, personally for myself, I just had a lot of experience with cannabis and, and certainly recognizing what quality cannabis is. So that's been a real advantage for me. And, you know, less has been more for me in my lifestyle that's sustainable for me, that works for me and my family. So I've always advocated that kind of the, the shoestring approach, you know, walk before you can run sort of, sort of idea with that and then maximizing and then also being progressive with the industry. So watch out for the new products, try to, you can turn your lights out for an extra hour a day before you harvest them, then do that. You can shut them off for 24 hours before you harvest, we do that. So we try to find little ways around where we can continue to maximize and continue to progress. Because there is, if you go for the biggest of the big, there's companies out there that are willing to lose millions of dollars a month just to get into this industry. And they're willing and have that stamina to do that for multiple years on end. And if we're going to compete against that, it's a very much, it feels like a David and Goliath situation. But I can tell you that out of the 15 stores that I've been to, I could show you something that we have sitting here that would make, put all of those guys to shame. It's embarrassing on what the recreational market is bringing to the population. Yeah, and you see the obvious opportunity where you guys can fit into that. And I think the little guy out there feels like David and Goliath. And, you know, there's a lot of people moving to other states where they think it may be better, where the regulations might be more favorable. It's, it's happening out here in Colorado. A lot of people are moving to Oklahoma because of the favorable regulations right now. But Things can change real quick. And, you know, those obvious hurdles that you guys are dealing with, that also is an advantage to keeping other people out, right? I mean, well, exactly. in, in Maine as well, we've had a really a unique situation where there's, there's a lot of community in Maine. There's a lot of people who have kind of root for each other. So there's a lot of caregivers who help each other. So while it's not happening as much now, but certainly like a kind of a co op model could be interesting to see, like a market, an open market sort of approach to it. Whereas we can kind of curate and pick some of the best farmers that we know and bring them all together to say, look at, well, we know 12 different really good growers, right? And they're all kind of small scale, relatively speaking to some of these big giant companies. But if we pull together and we all have something different and unique available, well, then we can bring more to the table that goes for back, a market, you know, that goes back to the local. Chris has been in downtown Portland since 2000. I, mean, I never left my town, hometown Amesbury. I did try to do the gold rush out to Humboldt County. And I was way before Murder Mountain. It was 2001. And out there, I realized I could make it out there, but I was dealing with a bunch of local boys. And I've really found the foothold that we had. If you're going to another state and chasing other regulations, there's 10 other people behind you with more money doing the same thing. And what we've done is we've put our feet down and anchored into the local economy. 
Amesbury is where we got our host agreement. It's where I live. It's where I know the people and I've been able to advance that because just knowing people. Portland, he's been able to really control, get a foothold in the culture there. And everybody knows him because he stayed in Portland. He hasn't moved all around chasing a million different nuggets. Is the culture in Portland, are people really understanding of we need to work together? Are they really feeling that? They are, absolutely. Yeah, they really are. Yeah, it's a unique situation and they really are. The population from Portland, Maine, or from Port or Maine <coughs> to Massachusetts, they're very, very different. Maybe 13 million yeah. in Massachusetts, 3 million in Maine. One of the things in Portland is there's a lot of accountability. You know, I mean, there is. We, we know people in Maine. We know our neighbors. We know people down the street. We know the other businesses. So it's the practices that, that kind of creates a different practice, right? Whereas if I'm living in New York City and I piss somebody off, well, I might never see them again. In Portland, well, they're going to know you. So that kind of helps sort itself out as far as business practices and behaviors. Again, there's a lot of accountability and it doesn't take much for people to recognize either really good behavior or poor practices. So we've always tried to stay ahead of that and just be progressive and do the right thing and put off a product that we're proud of. And, you know, it's a, it's a fleeting illusion for us in a sense, as far as how good it can be, how good the product can be. I'm my own worst critic on it's It's really never good enough. And it's always, we need to strive to make it better and to make sure that we consistently put off something that we believe in. Because if we believe in it and we love it, we know our patients are going to love it and our customers are going to love it and our family's going to love it. That's been kind of like the approach. We're not shooting to be Marlboro. We're not shooting to be McDonald's. We know there's going to be the Cure Leafs in the multi-state, multinational companies coming in. But we're really seeing it go more towards the, the craft brew or the wine industry. Yeah, I'm more of like a, even an artisan approach. You know? I would like to see a, it not sold on a weight value. And I want to see one of our nuggets in that one jar and said, this nugget is this. It, it doesn't matter on the weight, but this is the way it was grown. This is what it looks like. This is what it smells and tastes like. And the same bottle of wine with, two, with the same exact filling in both it goes for two hugely different prices just on the way it was handled after the fact. So then where do you see the future? You know, you bring up an interesting scenario where do you see the future of uh, vaping and, and concentrates fall into this because they're, they're huge i mean I, i'm certainly a big proponent of the solventless approach to extracts you know i've never been well i think they all have a great place and they're all wonderful products but they're big i mean we we're seeing the market use more and more of them i mean vapes i mean obviously as you know are huge and, and for the general culture they're shifting towards that. I mean, I think what I've noticed from a grower standpoint, you know, a lover of cannabis, a connoisseur of cannabis, is that there's been a real correlation. The more weed we have, it's not as good. You know, the quality seems to be dipping, but with a pen or a cartridge, people just, you don't it's a convenience thing, you know, and, it, and the quality is less of a concern for a lot of consumers. Not all of them, but for a lot of consumers, they're happy with what they're getting, and that's perfectly fine, but... It goes into the culture and educating our customers and our clients and letting them know that the experience when you get, when you're going to smoke a whole plant flower, it is a very different experience sitting around the campfire than, than ripping on your pen. And if you do choose to rip on your pen, we're going to point you towards the dry hashes, the solventless extracts rather than you. But it's, it's certainly big. It's a huge, huge, huge market. And we're seeing that the culture, I'm seeing that the culture is, is demanding it. Absolutely. People want it and they want a lot of it. So oils, shatters, distillates, isolates, THCA, and now we're at the beginning to separate some of those compounds. Do you guys um, plan on providing edibles and concentrates through your own manufacturing or are you going to look to other partners for that process? Probably through other partners. I and mean, again, we've in the main community, especially, I have those relationships and I'm fortunate to have them. People that I know are, are more experts in those fields. And I try to just stay in my lane and say, okay, well, my effort's best spent producing a high quality cannabis, the flower. How hard is it to stay in your lane? For me, it's not because I'm a plant person. And that's kind of <laughs> the same way I, I kind of veered from the hydroponic industry to go towards plants. I just love plants. I just what love about Matt? Matt, what about you? I'm excited to be in the industry and I'm excited to finally get the opportunity to make a brand for ourselves. To bring this product to the masses excites me. And even if the masses mean 250 people, the extra 
Tax market is saying that we're just going to focus on high quality flour. That's probably 45% of the market these days. Most of it is in edibles and vape pens. But again, I think that we can stuck, put ourselves on a shelf that's higher than everybody else's and, and people will pay what we ask for. And that will be a sustainable life for us. Making the $300 million seems a great idea and all, but uh, I come from a brick mason background. Uh, I'm the guy standing on your roof building a brick chimney. It might be a little too much for me. I know what we can complete. I, I know what we're good at. And it starts with two with initial capital. The grow facility that we're building, we're going to be well over a million bucks. If we're going to put an extract facility in there, the building alone is going to cost me another 200000 Then I got to stick a $600,000 extract machine in there. Now I have to hire a full-time chef. Now I'm looking at a, a payroll that is uh, close to a million dollars a year. And it does very much jam us into the middle of big business. And we're a couple of hippie kids from a small town. It gets a little scary. So, Yeah, it's a little bit intimidating, right? Yeah, we'll take our piece and hopefully our piece can fill our family. And if not, if I have to go pretend to be Santa Claus again, I will. So you brought up a lot of different thoughts that come over me is when you're building this, how do you... How do you live? How do you pay your own bills, right? How do you do? Chris sounds like he's got his uh, the grow company, which kind of helps sustain that. Right. So then every other waking minute, you're working to get the licenses together and get the grow together. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And Matt, what about you? Are you so, still running okay. a masonry company and stuff? Yeah. Up until a week ago, I finished my last large contract. I was running on a part-time crew. At our biggest we got, we got to eight guys for a couple of seasons. But the last two years have been down to me and two other guys. Laid those guys off a couple months ago. I've been finishing up the schedule. And uh, I've officially left that company. And with a little bit of savings, I'm going to try to make it through the next couple of months through construction. Yeah, I think that's another thing that people should really understand is that you guys are not only shoestring it, but you're also trying to pay your bills at the same time. Well, yeah, which is, you know, you're, you're risking it all. 2016, I can show you drafts there or business plans that we had in scales that we had that showed that right now, in 2019, we should be on our 15th harvest. We should be up $6 million. <laughs> and I should have been done with masonry. And I've told people for the last three years, this is my last job. This is my last job. But with... The permitting process being delayed and everything just getting kicked back further and further. It takes three times as much time as I, I thought. So I finally think we are at a point where, for me, it's a transition of a lifestyle. And that's another thing that people don't understand is dealing with the city and dealing with your fire marshals and your, I mean, you guys are just really, you, you've got, you're coming into a really big spot of it, right? Especially dealing with the greenhouse because yeah. you don't know until you go through it, right? So you're like, I think I should be on my 15th harvest, but the reality is that was what your projections were. It's not the reality of today, right? Today. Yeah. You have to have the drive to push through those low moments that when you realize, okay, I got to throw this piece of paper away because it's irrelevant. We're not meeting this deadline. And then set up another deadline for yourself and say, with just as much power and speed, I'm going to go hit that deadline. And when you miss that one, just set it up again and do it again. Especially if you haven't had a successful business, right? I mean, there's a lot of guys out there that have been entrepreneurs and started businesses, but until you really get that point and you get that moment, you're like, how it seems like both of you guys have gained some success in your other businesses. So you're able to understand that. But for the guy out there that is just starting up, how do you, words would you give him advice? Let's say, what would you say once he gets in this, how should he handle the stresses that come aboard, right? That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Chris speaks well of that. Not losing the focus of what makes you happy. You really have to stop. You're going to find yourself working after dinner, after the family goes to bed, and you still got to try to cut out some time for your life to do the things that used to make you really happy. And it will, it will make you happy. A lot of sacrifices to be made, absolutely. But if you're doing what you love, you know, I feel like I don't work at all. You know, I mean, I'm in that unique, rare position. So, you know, if you're passionate and you love it, then that should be the driving factor. You know, that hopefully should be the driving factor. And, and it's a beautiful thing. I mean, cannabis is a plant that the usage is going up throughout the whole United States. And I'm, I'm sure the whole world at that, I would not be surprised. I mean, the plant, you know, has an ability to catch on. And, and if people need to bring, we need ideas, we need new people. 
we need help. I mean, me growing it in a basement or in a barn, it can only go so far. You know, I can only provide it to so many people and more people want it. So, I mean, I'd encourage people to work together and to try to be progressive, try new things that they might not have seen. Certainly don't just look to your neighbor and do, you know, copy what he's doing. Include diverse people. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, there's a whole unique host of people that you can kind of look around to and you probably know somebody who has nothing to do with cannabis, but they're good at education or they're good at research or they're good at building and just working together ultimately has been proven to be one of the things that's helped us be successful. And don't forget why you're in it. Enjoy the little things that make you happy and realize what an incredible world we live in right now. I sat down with the chief of the police station and gave him my security plan for my cultivation facility that I'm building, asking him to sign off for it. 10 years ago, he's the guy that I said, oh shit, there's the blues, and got nervous and thought I was going to jail. Uh, the realm has changed so much, the world is on top of its head right now. This is the one opportunity guys like us have, and if you're in a situation like us, grab it and run with it. We're not IT guys, we didn't make it big in the tech thing. There's no more gold nuggets laying up in the hills of California, so prospecting that stuff's not gonna work. This is really a very good opportunity. A unique opportunity, for sure. For some work and It's just gonna take hard work. I mean, we've always just worked hard. I mean, Matt, of course, is the epitome of that, of being a mason, you know, and you know, us combining those sorts of skill sets and collaborating and working together, again, is one of the things I would point to, encourage people to try to do more of. Matt, being in those meetings like that is kind of surreal, right? When you're sitting there across it, the table. I can't believe it. No, especially where I'm a guy that was smoking cigars up on, a, on top of a roof, 30 feet in the air, yeah, setting bricks and, and big stones and things like that. And all of a sudden, then you're going out behind the work trail smoking a joint all nervous and now we're talking to the chief of police, talking to the mayor. The mayor of Amesbury signed me a permission slip to cultivate marijuana in Massachusetts. That was one of the greatest letters that was ever signed for me. I couldn't even sign my name to it, I was so excited. Yeah, I think that's, especially if you're coming from the somewhat gray market, right? And understanding that those are a part of the progress of, of the industry and understanding that that is a stretch that you have to take as an entrepreneur in order to grow your company. And, you know, I think that's really challenging for a lot of people to understand, to get over, uh, such as stretching yourself in any business. It doesn't matter if it's cannabis or not, right? It's taking that leap of faith that you have to be willing to do, right, to become right. successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's what it is. Yeah. I have a wife and two small children, and there are some people that look at me in my town now like I'm a bad person because they've been told something for so long. I see it as we're opening up a market. We're opening up a product to be researched in the potential benefits in the windfalls for society that could come out of this are much greater than putting people in jail over. Have you lost some friends? Kind of. Yes. Yes. There, there are some people that my relationship now is much different with once they knew that I was a closet pothead over a conservative brick mason. All of a sudden they said, oh my God, you're a liberal hippie, you're not a conservative brick mason. Things definitely have changed. Relationships have changed. And I'm guessing Chris probably, since he's kind of been in the area for quite some time out in the open, have you lost some friends? I'm, I'm curious. I gained a couple extra. <laughs> <laughs> I probably gained a few, you know? Yeah. It is kind of funny. Yeah, it's been a positive thing. And I've always, again, I've always kept it that way. So with people I interact with, other businesses, I've always just tried to be positive. And very be cool. And, and do the right thing. He's rubbed off on me very, very nicely. Well, good. Well, that's awesome. You guys are putting something together. It's, uh, it's rare that families can do that anymore. So guys, I want to thank you guys for being on the show today. How can people contact you guys? Yep, yep. So uh, indoorplantkingdom.com is the, uh, one of the websites that you can check out, as well as IPK 2.0 is my Instagram, which people can check out and they can kind of get a real feel of what's going on. We're also on Facebook for Indoor Plant Kingdom and LinkedIn through Indoor Plant Kingdom. And those are certainly some of the platforms. Jamaco, J-A-M-A-C-O, L-L-C.com. Jamaco, L-L-C.com. And then there's also Matt Jamaco, L-L-C for the Facebook and the Instagram is Jamaco uh, underscore L-L-C. All right. Well, glad you guys were on today and, and I look forward to your success and hearing about you guys in the future. Awesome. And, uh, and yeah, I, I wish you guys the best of luck. It's, uh, 
it's a hard it's a hard road but it's a, it's a fun road once you get there so keep looking towards that tunnel because that tunnel it'll get closer it does awesome, thank you brother. enjoy your evening thank you thank you Todd. guys you've just listened to another insightful episode of plant problems if you like what you heard so far don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblems.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frischknecht. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey.